there, there's just certain things where it becomes more of a relationship than this person's just coming in and every time they come in, they need something. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I have the great pleasure to be speaking with Jesse Tarr, who is the founder and president of City Permits. So City Permits was established in 2009 as a small company, only consisting of two to three employees, and has since grown exponentially over the past decade. And I think Jesse was saying to me they've got about 15 people now working with them. They're working nationwide rather than just in Washington, D.C., which is where they, they began. And it's really quite an exciting set of services that they provide. So they are expediters and Jesse is the first expediter that I think we've ever had on the business of architecture and I was very impressed with him all the way through the interview is knowledge expertise professionalism uh, and just passion for expediting was infectious and I never thought I would get this excited about talking uh, about such a bureaucratic uh process or service that's serving such bureaucratic um, and, you know, one of these parts of architecture that people complain about all over the world. So I, th- I really felt that there was a high level of entrepreneurial innovation um, with Jesse and what city permits are doing. Uh, we've had some clients at BOA who have worked with them, who have spoken very highly about them. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm excited to hear more experiences and to see how they are disrupting the sector. So in this week's episode, we are discussing why architects uh, can benefit from using an expediter and what that actually involves. We discuss how city permits has evolved and grown into new territories and to states. This is something usually, you know, an expediter has a specialist knowledge in one location. Uh, So Jesse talks us through how they've been able to scale that expertise and the strategies that they use when moving into territories that perhaps they haven't worked in before. And Jesse goes into a lot of detail about how technology, client relations, how their relationships with local authorities, um, and how business intelligence has been applied here within city permits to create a disruptive business. So this is really, really fascinating conversation. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Jesse Tarr. Hey, Enix Sears here from Business of Architecture. And if you run an architectural practice, then probably one of the most difficult parts about running your practice is making sure you get your fees right, getting the right fee for the job. Because if you undercharge, ultimately, as you know what ends up happening, is you get to the end of the fee and there's still more job left. In that case, you're juggling to try to rob Peter to pay Paul, stealing from a more profitable project to support the less profitable projects. And on the flip side, you probably don't want to charge your clients absorbently too much than you actually need to get the project done. So the question is, how do you charge the right fee? Well, one resource that's been lacking in the architecture industry for a long time now is some sort of guide or comparison about what architecture firms actually charge. If you try to run a Google search on it, what do architects charge, you'll find some outdated information that's wildly inaccurate. And so I just want to record this quick little video to let you know and get to so you can look forward to something that we're doing here at Business of Architecture, which is we will be launching a comprehensive fee report talking about and just revealing what architectural practices around the United States and elsewhere are actually charging, how they set their fees. Do they do percentage of construction costs? Is it stipulated some? Is it hourly not to exceed? Also, what are the particular amounts? We're really excited about this because ever since we started, uh, founded Business of Architecture over 10 years ago, this has been a common question is like, is my pricing right? Is my pricing right? And so this is the question that we hope to answer when we release in December, we'll be releasing uh, this fee report. Now, one of the advantages is of us as a consulting agency is that we can put out this kind of information. Unfortunately, as you know, if you're in the United States, a couple decades ago, the AI got into big trouble because they published a list of 
basically like a fee chart, right? So like a fee matrix. And then the United States Justice Department decided that that was price fixing. It was it was causing a monopoly. And so they got in big trouble for doing that. Well, fortunately, from our perspective, we're not limited to talk about fees because we're not an organization. We're not a membership organization. We don't represent architecture as a whole. We're simply a consultancy. And as a matter of fact, our job and our business is to help architectural practices to succeed. So this is why we're super excited about this. So this is just a heads up. Make sure you keep your eyes out on your inbox. If you're not already on our email list, head over to businessofarchitecture.com. Make sure you sign up for our free live video training, and then you'll automatically get put onto our email list. So you will be the first to be notified when we release the fee and compensation report. All right. This is specifically tailored for you. If you're a small architectural practice owner, you'll get to see very clearly what other people of similar size firms, similar size demographics, similar typologies are actually charging, how they set their fees. So you can start to answer that big question is, I wonder how I fit into what my competitors are charging. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice. Business of Architecture Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Jesse, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm very good. So you are officially the first expediter that we've ever had on the business of architecture. So that's a, a good way to start today's conversation. Um, I was really excited to speak with you because I, I was surprised, to be honest. I was surprised at first that we had someone who was working in the world of expediting reach out to us and, you know, it, it, it signaled a number of things. Number one, this is somebody who's got a marketing and commercial and innovative approach because it's really unusual for an expediter to kind of you know be this be that be like that and then just looking at what you guys have been doing with city permits so you're the founder of city permits um and i know that you've worked with some of our clients in the past who only had wonderful raving reviews to to talk about um so it, it, it all kind of coalesced into a very exciting opportunity to be able to, to chat with you. So welcome. And I guess the first question is, what is City Permits and how did it begin? Well, Ryan, first, I want to say thank you so much for having us on on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, to answer your question, City Permit is a full service expediting company. Uh, we help our clients facilitate permits and business licenses and anything that has to do with those permits or business licenses in terms of getting a project from, you know, production and into the pipeline. Um, mm -hmm. So for example, an, an added service that we recently brought on board was shorty and performance bonds. We were finding that specifically with our right of way permits or with our general contractors mm -hmm. sourcing subcontractors, a lot of times they were running into problems with bonding. And so that was another uh, bolt-on that we were able to add to our core business. And our idea is to provide a white glove service. Uh, we found mm -hmm. that a lot of expediters were merely courier services, just couriering things back and forth. And uh, for that, you know, there's, there's USPS, there's FedEx, DHL. We strove and strive to set ourselves apart by leveraging relationships and being experts in our niche industry so that our end user, be it the architect or the GC or even the homeowner, has a better overall experience when dealing with their local government. Mm -hmm. So how, why the world of expediting? Was this, uh, was this something that you'd always been interested in? I, mean, I know your background is predominantly a, from a business perspective and business, right. business training. Was it something that you had kind of evaluated and saw a market gap or you were kind of auditing the current existing businesses that work in the world of expediting and, and saw that there was an opportunity there? How did it uh, come? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I actually stumbled on it um, completely inadvertently. I went to business school down in Miami, Florida at Florida International University. And when I graduated, I graduated in 2012, uh, I was struggling to find uh, work. Um, mm -hmm. The Miami job market was definitely not as strong as my home area, the DC metro area. And so I ended right. up moving back home and I started working in insurance um, as a claims adjuster for Geico. 
great company. Um, but to be honest with you, Ryan, I hated it. <laughs> I, I couldn't stand it. And uh, I didn't want to go back to school. And so I started racking my brain and, and going on Google and YouTube and um, researching, you know, what was something that I could do that wouldn't require me to get some higher level of, of education or professional certification, if you will, mm-hmm. um, that could add a stream of income. I was, I was struggling, student debt, credit cards, and sure. I stumbled across bartending. I eventually left Geico and I started bartending and I thought that was great. I was making you know, what I made all week at Geico in just one or two nights, especially if it was a great Friday or Saturday night. It was a lot more fun as well. (laughs) And it was a lot more fun. Yeah. You know, there were some added benefits there, Um, (laughs) but it was seasonal and uh, I was tired, you know, the long nights and and being on your Mm -hmm. feet for eight, 10 hours at a time was wearing on me. And one day uh, my dad, we we had a small, well, he had a small um, general contracting outfit. They did mainly four units and below additions, decks, uh, interior guts, and up to four unit um, like quad plexes. And he had a permit that he needed me to run. And uh, it was in Baltimore County. He didn't want to make that drive. And he asked me if I wanted to do it. And it paid pretty good. And I said, well, well, sure. So what, what do I have to do? How does this work? And I remember I had run some permits for him back in high school um, in Montgomery County. And they, they were very simple, like electrical trade permits, things of that nature. This was big. Mm-hmm. This was a, a pipeline project for natural gas. And I did it. And it took me about four weeks to get the permit from start to finish. And I got paid. And I remember the feeling when I got paid was like, wow, this is great. How do I do this more? Uh, the mm-hmm. customer was happy. I was happy. And it, it then I sought the quest of, okay, I, I figured out this permit expediting thing. I didn't even know about this until, you know, just a month ago. And how do I, how do I create more business? What do I do? And so then I started knocking on doors. I, I started with uh, trade contractors and uh, trade contractors. Uh, I love them to death, but they're, they're a different, uh, they're a different breed. <laughs> I was knocking yeah. on doors. I was getting cussed out. I was getting tossed out, escorted off premise by security. <laughs> um, it was, you know, architects, at least when they kick you out, they, they, uh, they're a little bit nicer. Right. <laughs> right. They're, they're gracious. Right. You know, uh, but, but trade contractors, man, they're rough, especially, especially plumbing. <laughs> plumbing yeah. guys are, they, they're, they're no nonsense. And, uh, I, I would, I would still pass out the card or I, you know, I drop a card on the way out on purpose by accident. And, and sure enough, it was like hundreds and hundreds of no's. And then finally, one day I got a call and, Hey, are, do you still do that expediting? I, yeah, I, I do. Can I help you? Yeah, we got this permit. It's stuck. If you can get it fixed by Monday, um, you've got our business. And so I went in and I was able to, I was able to talk to a supervisor and get the permit and I, and I rushed it and I was able to get it issued. And, and that was how I was able to start proving my worth and our track record started with mm-hmm. the trade contractors. Uh, then I would ask them, Hey, you know, do you know any, any GCs or any architects that might be looking for some help? And slowly, but surely, uh, I was able to expand, um, my book of business. And, and so what, what were you seeing some of the, perhaps the problems that many traditional expediters were kind of encountering or where did you see that you could improve upon an already, you know, well-trodden existing, existing business model? Sure. Sure. I, I quickly noticed, um, a couple things about the expediting community. One, as you said, it, it, it is very well trodden for those that know and for those that are in the biz, if you will, but that Mm -hmm. also creates massive opportunity. There's a lack of innovation. There's a lack of leveraging technology. Uh, A lot of the folks that are in expediting their smaller family outfits or mom and pop, and they're, you know, they're pushing 60, 70 years old, and they've, Mm -hmm. they've got their way of doing things. They've been doing it for 40 years and they're not changing. Um, And they really don't have to market, right? They, everybody knows who they are. if, if, If you need a permit, you know, call John or call Called Jim or whoever it might be, and mm-hmm. and that's just kind of how it works. So I saw an opportunity. I was hungry. I was new. I was eager to learn. Uh, I immersed myself in the code. I would go to every single webinar that the county offered. You know how to do a deck permit, uh, changes in the code that are coming up, and what you should know. I would just as much free information as I could get. I would get, and I quickly saw that managing projects through email, this was probably the first thing that I changed. Managing projects through email um, is cumbersome at best. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you're, you know, on, on even the smallest project of an addition, you could be dealing with upwards of 10 individuals between the design team, the contractor, the owner, maybe the, you know, the husband, wife, or a, a family members involved. And you're getting emails from all these different people about the same thing. And it's hard to keep up. And I remember I would be in the shower or I would be at the gym early in the morning where I would wake up in the middle of the night like, oh, my God, I, I, did I upload that revision? I, I would run over to Project Docs and I would check it all. So I, oh, whew, I did. And I would go through my emails. I was like, there's got to be a better way. I'm going to have a heart attack. And I discovered Basecamp, this project management software. I had actually been introduced to it at another expediting company that I worked for uh, just prior to starting my venture. And I decided to pay the money for it and use it. And a lot of people push back at first. Um, but my, my big upsell with Basecamp is, uh, one, it's backed by Amazon. So you know it's great software or else, you know, yeah. Jeff Bezos wouldn't have bought in. And then two, uh, you don't have to learn anything new. If, if you want to mm -hmm. use your, your AOL.com, that's fine. Like it will email right to your email and you can just reply as you would a regular message and attach things or not. And you don't have to learn anything new. And that was very important to me. And I did a lot of testing of other uh, softwares out there and I just felt Basecamp was the most functional. And I, and I saw there was a lapse in communication and a lapse in organization. Um, mm -hmm. If you're not well, it's, organized, it'll, it'll just cause issues with expediting. So so it's, it's interesting, most expediters, I imagine, like, as you say, they're mom and pop kind of businesses, maybe it's one or two of them, or they're sole traders, right. kind of working, working alone, and then they've got a kind of uh, a select group of clients that they just kind of right. keep going back and forth. Yeah. So how are you, how are you starting to look at scaling it or, um, again, kind of building upon the project management technology that you can start to implement how sure. did it start to, to, to grow into the business that it is now sure so and that's a great point at, at the beginning i wasn't getting the good jobs i was getting the mm -hmm. jobs that uh you know not to disparage anybody but not all architects are created equal and i was getting some of the jobs <laughs> where nobody really wanted to work with that design professional or the expediter was notorious for uh maybe being less than above board we'll call it and right. I would get these jobs that had been submitted and uh, they were all, for lack of better words, jacked up and they're, they're on cycle three or four and it's a nightmare project that was supposed to take three months and they're on month nine. And I would, I, I would turn it around. I was like the cleanup guy, the cleanup crew. And while those jobs were very cumbersome and oftentimes I would just break even or even lose money sometimes because I didn't know my pricing uh, strategy back then. I was just kind of winging it um, mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what other people were charging and what the market would bear. I learned so much and, and having to unpack a job and get it back on track. I, I learned so much. I have to meet with so many reviewers and, 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 oh, this form was done wrong and this was done wrong. And I found that, like you said, with this, with the solopreneurs and the smaller teams, the communication, the city or the county is notorious for you send in an email or you make a phone call. They usually promise a turnaround of 24 to 48 hours and they consistently fail to deliver. Or mm -hmm. when they do deliver, they answer your question with some like generic redirect that doesn't help you at all. So I sought to, people have questions, people need answers. And I might, and Geico taught me this, I might not give you the answer you want, like your car is a total loss, right? That's really hard mm -hmm. to tell people that their car's been totaled, they're in an accident. But I can help you navigate that process in terms of getting on to the next step. So you might not want to hear that you got this comment or you might not want to hear that you can't design it this way. And I understand that. But here's the solution. If you want to take the path of least resistance, let's go this way. If you want to push back a little, I can set up a meeting. And I became a conduit to open a line of communication in more mm -hmm. real time and holding the jurisdiction accountable to their service level agreement which meant mm -hmm. that projects were actually coming out as advertised on their website. And so with that, the next challenge I noticed was you talked about scaling. When you're doing the marketing and the sales and the customer service and the project management and the customer retention, you know, it, it, I, I was working 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week, and it's just not sustainable. So I was like, wow, I really need to get help. And that's where it started with, okay, let me hire a PM 
or let me hire an assistant project manager to help me. And I went on the quest of scaling. And that was a challenge in of itself. A, a lot of expediters I, I know, they either shy away from scaling because they say, I've tried that, you know, you can't trust anybody and, and, and people don't, you know, they're not reliable, which is true. I mean, in any industry, it's, it's really hard to find good talent. Um, mm -hmm. Or there was kind of this attitude of, I have the, the market share that I want or that I've had and been accustomed to for decades. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're doing pretty well for themselves. And I'm not really interested in changing that. Oh. Like if it's not broke, don't fix it kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, so I was one of the few, um, if not maybe one of the only ones that I can think of that was like, no, I, I need this. This is scalable. And, and I mm -hmm. found that I started mainly in D.C., but as I expanded to Maryland and Virginia and other states and other uh, townships and jurisdictions, everywhere is broken. It's like 80% of the same code, then 20% of that locality's nuances, but every, nobody answers. Everywhere is broken. Everybody is backwards. And so if you can provide this solution, um, and I think if you can provide it in D.C., which quite frankly, is one of the hardest jurisdictions to permit, in my opinion, in the nation with all the federal mm -hmm. overlays and sister agencies and things of that nature, you can do it anywhere. It's just a matter of keeping the quality high, keeping that service level of service high. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't easy, Ryan. Uh, you know, I, I definitely had my share of challenges scaling and uh, my longtime customers will attest to it. Well, but, I guess one of the one of the kind of fascinating things about this is a business proposition, and one of the things that many architects will get very frustrated with all around the world is, you know, part of our service that we're providing to clients is dealing with these large institutional bureaucratic organizations that have got very little commercial intelligence or care. They're right. not running it like a commercial entity. There isn't. They're not under the same pressures to make profit and to deliver things on on time necessarily. And right. at the end of the day, you have to go through them. There isn't a a way around it. So they've got a kind of monopoly right. on. Them. Therefore, it, it it means that interacting with these kinds of organisations is inherently difficult. And particularly if you want to push things forward or get them faster, like how? So how do you how do you mitigate that as a risk in the business? And particularly as right. you're scaling up, because you know, if you're if you're scaling up and you're having that kind of problem magnified, gosh, then it's like headache, headache central. Right, right. I, I think so I think you hit the nail right on the head. They do have a monopoly. Um, you are forced to go through them. Uh, they don't care, right, whether your job gets issued or not, unless they're, you know, maybe it's high level or politicized in some way, they get paid the yeah. same and they know mm -hmm. you have to use them regardless. Uh, yeah. But in, in that turmoil also lies the opportunity. In that crisis lies the opportunity. The common element is humans. It's human resources. Mm -hmm. And if you can leverage relationships and build relationships, Yes, people are not supposed to give you preference. People are not supposed to uh, give you any sort of, uh, you know, advantage because your application should be treated as every other. But when I come in every day and you see me every day and I find out that uh, your, your son has uh, volleyball or basketball and I get to know who you are as a person and I'm following up on your personal life, maybe every now and again, I'll, I'll bring um, your favorite food and I know well, I can't just bring it for you because that's a gift and then I'm bribing a federal official, but I can bring it <laughs> for the entire floor, right? I can, I can get 500 brownies and, and people won't do that. They won't, they won't spend that money or spend that extra time to get to actually know somebody um, and know what's going on in their personal life. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that makes it uh, monotonous and robotic. You know, if, if, if mm -hmm. I'm dealing with you and Ryan, I, I need this, or where are we with the revision? It becomes a very transactional uh, exchange. But if mm -hmm. I can bring back that human element, Ryan, you know, I, 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 uh, I heard that, uh, you know, Chelsea won, or, you know, I, I find out what you're into, and I start, I start talking about that. And, and, you know, maybe there's a common interest there somewhere. It'll be, it'll be Tottenham, Tottenham. <laughs> so there would be a common interest in it. and I and I explore that interest and I really get to know you as a person and then also 
um, you know, life happens to everybody. So when things do happen, I'm plugged in. I, I can send flowers because your, your, you know, your father passed away or, or your mother is sick or there, there's just certain things where it becomes mm-hmm. more of a relationship than this person's just coming in and every time they come in, they need something. There, there'd often be times where I would go um, and maybe I wouldn't need anything, but I would just stop by and just have a conversation mm-hmm. with the different folks that work. And I, you know, and sometimes I would just say, Hey, you don't need anything. No, I, I just, I wanted to say, thank you. You know, you're always so pleasant to deal with. And I'm sure even though I'm not dealing with you today, I'll be dealing with you next week or at some point in the near future. But it was nice talking to you. I just wanted to say thank you for, for all the hard work you do. It means a lot. And yeah. uh, it helps me. Um, and uh, I, 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 you know, I, I would look to recognize them too when surveys come out. I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very much so on, you know, recognizing the people because there are people in these agencies that do work hard, that do care, that do show up on time, and they should be uplifted. And so mm-hmm. recognizing them when it comes time for that customer service award or, or sending in that email to their supervisor, a lot of people won't take the time. Um, to show that they care or to, or to share a token of their appreciation. And so mm. I think that's what I really focus on is be polite, be respectful, um, and build and foster and leverage relationships, obviously within reason, but, but leverage them. Because at the end of the day, you're right. These agencies process tens of thousands of applications every year. What makes you any different? And that's where you have yeah. to figure out how to stand out and be pleasant to deal with. Wow. That's very, very impressive. And, uh, you know, I, I guess as well, there's a high level of emotional and relational intelligence that you're exhibiting here with doing this. And I would just, I'd probably hazard a guess that for most people in the world of expediting, that their personality type is probably a little bit more process driven or detail orientated or things orientated as opposed to people right. orientated, which right. means that, well, why would I waste the time to trying to develop the relationships when we've got to get the, you know, the, the bits of code, it's all about the code, but actually what you're right. saying here is that behind the process are people. And if you can do something to make them feel good when it comes to processing and handling your, your requests, then you've just increased the likelihood of it getting done sooner, quicker, more effectively. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, be, be a professional in your space. I, I related mm-hmm. all the time to, uh, to the courtroom. You know, uh, I, I read, a, I read a quote one time I was in, a, I was in a, a law office and I read a quote, hit a pillow and it said a, uh, a good lawyer knows the law. A great no- lawyer knows the judge. Well, you know, I, I, I want to be that great lawyer. I want to know the judge. Because at the end of the day, we, we all kind of have a certain level, a base level of proficiency. But again, mm-hmm. that, that I think that speaks, speaks to the relationship. What's your relationship? Yeah. Amazing. So tell me a little bit about how, how it's been going in terms of expanding the business. And I know that you're not just working in DC anymore. You're, you're working in different jurisdictions. Sure. And again, that, that's when I heard that, I, I thought that was incredibly impressive because, you know, a, a lot of a lot of the way that expediters would sell their services would be on being experts on the nuances of certain locales. So as soon as you start expanding across to other places, how do you manage to kind of keep the same level of, uh, of, of detail and knowledge, intimate knowledge, and also relationships like you're, like what you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, we started, like you said, in D.C. The expansion to Maryland and Virginia was just a matter of time. They're, they're neighboring mm-hmm. states or, or territories. And um, I grew up in Maryland. I, I knew people in Virginia in those offices all the time. When I moved, I relocated to Florida uh, with my spouse uh, in 2018. And I was faced with this challenge of, OK, I've built this business. It's successful it's definitely not successful enough for me to step away. I'm still intimately involved with the day to day. How am I going to manage this? And in 2019, I was flying back and forth so much on American airlines that TSA staff in both airports knew me by first name. It was as if I was going on my morning commute, my afternoon commute. I, I racked up so many miles uh, that I became, and not because not I purchased any type of special program or anything, but I became like a gold member 
So priority boarding and all these great perks, but I was also flying uh, two, three times a week, um, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then COVID hit and everything stopped for a second. Mm -hmm. And quickly, cities realized that their department of buildings or their planning and zoning, is, it's one of the biggest revenue generators for every municipality nationwide. So they had to yeah. figure out how to keep that on. And construction was declared essential as with healthcare everywhere except I think Boston. Um, and so very quickly we saw a transition to online. A lot of uh, jurisdictions were already hybrid. They were already online with an e-plan or project docs or Evolve type software to upload and review documents. Um, but then they, they went fully online. DC was probably one of the first. Uh, one of the last would have been like Baltimore County. But what that allowed me to do was I already had a field team in DC. I had trained them myself and they had developed relationships and foster relationships of their own in addition to um, carrying on and, and, and continuing the relationships I had developed. And I was back and forth so much, it was as I, it was as I've never left. Um, I was able to kind of explore this remote office idea of building out a team of project managers in Miami, but still having field staff in the areas that we operate. And it, it worked out uh, very well for us. Um, we were able to keep boots on the ground because like mm -hmm. you said, that a lot, of, a lot of larger expediting firms, they say they're nationwide, but then you, they, they, they sell you your services and you're, you're dealing with somebody that's not related to their company and there's that issue of reliability and are they really an expert or is it just like a retired truck driver that they hired off Craigslist and you start mm -hmm. dealing with all these issues. I sought to keep everything in house. I, I want my, protecting the brand was of utmost importance for me. And so we were able to expand DC, Maryland, Virginia, then into Florida because we're hiring people up and down um, Broward, Palm Beach, and Dade. And then it was nothing if we needed to maybe take a day trip to Tampa, or Orlando, or Jacksonville. And so we were able to have that same white glove boots on the ground approach, but a lot of cities were doing things digitally. And a lot of things that used to be paper are now digital and they're there to stay. So they, mm -hmm. you might still need to do human interaction, but for example, payments, a lot of payments used to be check or, or, or not cash, but check or, or, or money order in person mm -hmm. or credit card in person only. These agencies were forced to formulate some type of online portal. And so we're able to do a lot more remotely. They still know us. Um, and if it's a, somewhere where we've never been, I'm very honest with the customer. Like maybe it's North Carolina. I, I don't have boots on the ground in North Carolina. And I say, hey, look, I, I don't have boots on the ground there. I, I, we, we have the expertise to do this. Well, we had such a good experience with you in Miami or in DC that we really want to use you. And if it's a big enough project and we need to fly somebody out there and put them up in a hotel um, for a week or two, at the beginning or the end or some critical stage of the project, we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's how we've been able to expand. And COVID was really the catalyst because it forced all these jurisdictions to accelerate uh, their processing, payments, reviewing, having that all be done online. Amazing. So what, who, well, who, uh, is the person that typically you're the one that that you lays, liaise with around winning work, right? So is it do you get do you, is it architects that bring you a lot of work, or you is it contractors, or is it still a mix? And in in specific with the architects, like why does an architect use an expediter as opposed to do it themselves? Sure, sure. I, I'd say it's still a healthy mix. Um, our bulk of business is probably architects and engineering firms, specifically mm -hmm. architects and civil engineers. They're the ones that reach right. out to us primarily uh, and, 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 and usually initially. General contractors are good, but general contractors, they are usually only reaching out to us for uh, permits that come after the building permit. So maybe if it's a corn shell and it's already been built out, they might reach out to us for that tenant fit out or tenant layout. Or if that's already been declared, they're reaching out to us for some type of after hours or expanded hours permit 
maybe a right of way permit to block a lane or do wet utilities. Um, and then homeowners, you know, that's usually just the smaller jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. But A and E firms are are definitely, uh, I would say, like the bread and butter, and that's where you want to be. You can help them with the planning. Um, you can also assist them a lot when it comes to design, especially when it comes to zoning regulations. Like if we want to do this, what does that entail? Will it trigger this or that? And that's where we become very, very valuable to them in terms of setting up that that preliminary design review meeting or that a pre-submission conference with, with a certain reviewer or supervisor so that they can get that valuable feedback uh, mm -hmm. before they've fleshed out a design that isn't going to work. So architects are very, very good at design. They're very mm -hmm. good at design. They're very pragmatic. They're very logical people. And what I find uh, drives them crazy is when they have to step out of that world of the private service side, the private sector, and they step into our world of the public sector and it's like people aren't answering emails, things aren't making sense. If he read the plans, my notes clearly state what he's already <laughs> asked. And so it just becomes very frustrating and they don't have the time to juggle managing project management of compliance and review and working on uh, whatever other uh, design requirements they have in, in addition to ongoing construction consultancy and things of that nature. And so it's easier for them to have us manage it, deal with that day to day, keep track of it. Cause that's another thing you have to keep a lot of times what we find when architects and engineers do it, it's not that they can't, they're very good at doing it because they, nobody knows the design better than them. They did it, <laughs> but keeping track of everything, you know, they, they haven't got back to me in two months. Well, they owed you a response 30 days ago. Really? Oh my goodness. And, and now they're playing catch up and it's just an extra thing that's added to their plate. And it's, it's so monotonous and tedious. And you, like you said, uh, architects are compelled to offer the best service at the best mm -hmm. price. Municipalities aren't. So the hiring yeah. and the quality of employee on an average uh, is not the same. I was talking to somebody in DC and they had met, he was, he was up there. I won't mention his name, but he was, he was up there in the ranks. And he had mentioned that according to their own grading metrics, their agency was performing at about a 62% rate, a D, a D average. And I said, how is that okay? And he said, well, you know, it funds a lot of other programs like the Metro and, uh, you know, money goes to other public service programs and it's working. So, you know, we, and I just can't imagine any private sector entity being okay with a D average according to their yeah. own metrics. And so mm -hmm. we're able to deal with those folks. We know how to get in touch with some of those folks that are more difficult or, uh, you know, a lot of times what we find is, yeah, that it is already on the plans. Um, mm -hmm. You just didn't look. And mm -hmm. it's tough because the, the code is standardized, but then the people that are reviewing the code are individuals and the people that are submitting are also individuals. So it's not like they're getting uniform plan sets. Some, some architects have different layouts. Generally, they're the same. If you can read plans, you can find all the information, but yeah. they're also if something isn't where they're used to seeing it, or if it's not extremely, this is something I tell architects all the time. Uh, a design that's easy to interpret is better than this super complicated uh, design that might get you in the AIA magazine, right? You want something easy to interpret that a reviewer can flip through very quickly and find the information they're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, the harder it is for them to find, the less likely you are to get through. And, it's just because they have so many jobs to get through and they're not going to, they're just not going to take their time to look mm -hmm. now. That's where the relationships come in. They'll call you and ask you, Hey, I can't find this. Can you, can you guide me to it? But I think it comes down to architects. They hire expediters because it, the value in terms of having an expert do it. Um, it's, it's the same reason they hire like mechanical electrical and plumbing engineers to do that. They could probably do it, but why stumble through that? It's not their niche. So, so is it a an, an art in the same way that there's quite an art to um, presenting information for craftspeople uh, and for fabricators because there's a specific set of dimensions that they want to know. There's a certain way that they want information to be read. There's certain 
ways that they know that they prefer to digest information. It sounds like actually this is the same thing with when we're working with these um, jurisdictions is that there's an art to being able to communicate the information and that if it's buried too difficult, you know, too deeply in stuff, then it becomes harder. Are Absolutely. there, are there any, are, are there any sorts of formulas or tips that you would give architects that, you know, or what, how you work with your own, with your own architectural clients of how they can make that communication easier? Absolutely. So we, we're not at liberty to share plans that are not approved, right? Because yeah. uh, there's NDAs and there's things that we sign with our clients, but once plans become approved, they're public record and we can get right. them from uh, the agency's website oftentimes. So we'll find out what project you're doing. We go into our database. Do we have any similar project types which are already approved? We often do. And we'll share approved mm -hmm. plans. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, this is what worked already. Right. Oh, okay. I, 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 yeah, you know, you probably want to back out some of this information. That's another thing too. You don't, it, it's this, it's this balance, this catwalk of giving just enough to get approved, but not too much to create a whole bunch of unnecessary comments. <laughs> and so oftentimes we're helping architects back out a lot of things that they might put in their, their G and P set or their a hundred percent CD set that mm -hmm. really for our purposes is just going to make everybody's life harder. Sure, use that set, you know, and refer to that set when you're building, but have this this set that has just a little bit of that shaved off so that there's not all these questions and concerns about things that really don't affect the integrity of the, of the structure at all. Uh, yeah. And then, like you said, the presentation, we show the plans that have been approved because this is what was approved before. Or, you know, if we get a certain reviewer and we're running into a challenge, we'll go back, well, what did this reviewer want to see in the past? And we'll show them comments and the responses to those comments that helped get approval. And so we become like an encyclopedia or a database to help present that information and package the information in a way that has the highest likelihood of getting approved. Or, you mm -hmm. know, if it's a revision submission, has the highest likelihood of getting approved with the least amount of revisions. Amazing. Now, you, you your team's grown to 15. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And and how is it structured then? And how do you main, you know, what, what sorts of people are you looking for that make good team members? Because it's interesting, and as we said before, perhaps the, in the world of expediting, most people would be more sort of detail process orientated. Right. But here, it sounds like you need both. You need the detail orientation, orientated individuals, plus you need fantastic communicators to be developing the relationships with the um, local authorities and jurisdictions. Absolutely. Uh, it depends on the role, um, but our, our company is structured. It's a small unit leadership. I'm the owner operator. Uh, mm -hmm. Rodrigo Martinez is our operations manager. Then we have two team leads and under those team leads fall project managers and assistant project managers. Lateral to that, we have a field supervisor, uh, Benji, and he's been with me for about six years. He's very good and he manages all the field associates and they coordinate pickups and drop offs. And if we have to go see a reviewer or mail a check or mail, no parking signs, things of that nature. And what we look for, you know, the pandemic created a great opportunity for us as a company because suddenly a lot of people were out of work, especially a lot of people in hospitality and tourism and being in South Florida. And those people have to be detail oriented. You know, you're taking orders. Uh, people, this person doesn't want mayonnaise. This person is allergic to dairy. This person uh, might have this certain allergy and you got to remember all this and it's fast paced and you got to get it right. You have to be good on your toes, uh, good with customer service, a great communicator and good with invoicing and billing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we found that some of our best hires came from managerial level and director level positions in hospitality and tourism with some of the major hotel chains and cruise lines uh, oh, that were you know, laid off. Uh, now some of them went back when, when they opened up and it was, it was, mm -hmm. okay, it was understood, but some of them were like, no, this is great. I, I, I'm not having to run around. I like this work. It's a change of pace. And so that was a real opportunity for us. Uh, and then other than that, we're looking, we're just looking for people that are driven. One of the biggest concerns we get from applicants is I, I don't, I don't have any construction experience or I don't have any expediting experience. This mm -hmm. can be taught. It's, do you have the mindset? Do you have the skill set? 
uh, that maybe can't be taught, or I don't want to take the time to teach you <laughs> to be a mm -hmm. good communicator. If you're a good communicator, yeah. but you're an English major, I can, we can teach you how to expedite and be effective. Uh, yeah. But we can't help somebody that isn't a good communicator or is stuck in their ways and not willing to learn something new. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, really, really, really fascinating. So, how, what, what kind of training process then do you put your team through? What does an, what does onboarding look like for somebody who's come from the hospitality industry? And I, sure. you know, I just want to acknowledge, acknowledge that because it's such a, it that's for me that's being really entrepreneurial and very innovative and recognizing a set of skill sets from another industry, which is, which is plentiful in another industry, and then starting to apply it into another industry that typically hasn't demonstrated that kind of hosting communication element, which then completely transforms the level of, of service right. that can be, that can be delivered. And I, right. for me, that I find that's fascinating. Yeah. On onboarding is, uh, so we do a 90 day onboarding process. Um, there's four weeks of training where in the mm -hmm. initial week, they don't touch any projects. They just shadow and they're learning. We've also used Trainual. Um, it's an online training platform and we've created yeah. tutorials, basically proprietary tutorials where we teach you uh, how to do any type of permit that we've ever done in any jurisdiction. It's an encyclopedia. It's searchable. It's, and so you can, if you're, when you get a job dispatched, you're not just thrown out there on your own. You'll have, you'll be working in tandem with somebody uh, for the mm -hmm. first 90 days. And at each 30 days, we kind of peel back that hands-on support and encourage you to search the training material if you have a question. But if you have a certificate of occupancy, for example, in DC, you'll search the video and either myself or if the video has been updated because they've changed the process. A lot of videos were updated due to COVID because a lot of minor uh, process changes occurred. And we're recording and we're showing you in real time with a screen share and audio and notes how to pull this permit. And if you run into trouble, these are the points of contact you should reach out to and how they like to be addressed. And we've, we've created like a permitting Bible uh, that they can reference. And then we keep very close eye on that's that's why we have that that kind of I was in the military, I was in the Marines for four years, and I learned about small unit leadership. And what they do is inside of any larger unit, there's several smaller units where there's somebody that's in a leadership billet that's always accountable for the work of that team. And it, it goes all the way down to the fire team unit, which is four people, and it can go all the way up to the battalion level, which could be over, you know, a couple thousand people. But that, that top leader is never talking to everybody. A leader mm -hmm. talks to a couple other leaders who then reports up and it, 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 it funnels up until it hits that one person. And that makes us very effective. And we have built-in quality controls and checks. They're not foolproof. We're always improving and going back to mm -hmm. the drawing board. But oftentimes we're able to catch things before the reviewers do or before the customer does and fix it in real time uh, because of that small unit leadership style that we've implemented. You, so you literally are the Marines of expediting. <laughs> Trying to be, yeah. <laughs> love it. I love it. And I, I, as I said, I, I really appreciate that kind of level of innovation and what you're saying here about using something like Trainual and having this video database of permitting. That becomes an incredible amount of um, institutional knowledge for the business Right. which is only going to have that kind of flywheel effect where the more work that you do, um, the more that you've got a, a good system in place for documenting and recording the, the, the knowledge, which, is, uh, which means that you can train people up quicker to become right. expediting experts. And they don't necessarily need to be the expediting experts because the expertise is embodied in the, in the business within the systems, right. which, means that, which means then you've got this you know, now we can start taking people who are brilliant communicators and are detail orientated from a different industry, and then they can, you know, you, it's a very empowering environment. That's exactly right. And to your point, I've noticed that the more time, resources, money we invested on ramping up our training, uh, inversely, the time it took to train people significantly decreased. 
it went from like right. a nine month ramp up period to some people, even though we have them on probation and their trading status for 90 days, they're, they're ramped mm -hmm. up in like three or four weeks and they're really ready. I mean, we keep a close eye on them just to make sure, cause it is a new industry and there's so much to learn. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I learn something new every day, but our, I've noticed that it's, it, it was a long drawn out process and it was a lot of work up front, but now it's just a little bit of maintenance, adding new stuff as we go. And the training side, uh, wow, what a difference, um, especially bringing somebody with no prior experience, how quickly mm -hmm. uh, they're able to you know, speak that language that architects and contractors and reviewers can speak. Mm. Could you give us an example of some of the results that your business is producing with, with clients? Like what, is it, what does it look like? How sure. quick are things happening? And, and perhaps like results where clients would normally, they in the past have been getting stuck. Sure, sure. I would say on average, um, you know, compared to, because the, the, the cities will, will advertise their review times, but oftentimes mm -hmm. it's not how quickly a project will come out. On average, uh, for smaller projects, construction costs under a million, we're able to get those out in 60 days or less, calendar days, uh, where we were finding that our clients were taking upwards of six months at times, just because of the lacks in communication and the breaks down you know, as they were going through the process. For projects that are, uh, I would say, and it depends, right, because a, a tenant interior could potentially be 10 million, but it can st we can still get those out relatively quickly. So excluding tenant interiors, I'm, I'm talking about level two, level three alterations, uh, things of that nature. Uh, we, we've been able to save our clients months, typically, uh, in the overall timeline. Raises mm -hmm. where you have to demolish a building down to the ground, the fastest we've been able to get a raise is 90 days. Uh, usually those take a year. Uh, is what we've wow. been hearing. Um, certificates of occupancy with third-party inspections. We're typically taking some of our clients six weeks, eight weeks. We're now getting those down to where we're having them issued inside of, on average, eight eight days. So we're we're as we as we continue. Um, and as they've digitized things, and that's a question that we get asked all the time, well, now it's digital. What, what, what's the difference of me doing it myself? And, and my response, uh, as humbly as I can be, is, well, well go ahead. You know, it's online. Ha have, have at it. Because mm -hmm. even though it's online, the, the, the process, the knowledge, you still have to know how to navigate it. So just because mm -hmm. it's online, does it make it easier? Uh, I guess in the sense that you don't have to physically go there, but our business model, we had people there anyway, uh, open to close uh, week over week. At, at like, for example, one of our busiest jurisdictions, DCRA, at one point we had three people there full time, every day open to close. And it was because we were having so much work that we had different people on different floors and they could tag team with each other. Uh, and it, it so for us, it, it's not really a matter of if it's online or offline. What we found is when it was online, the municipalities love to tote that they're innovative and they're, they're forward thinking and everything's online and it's great and it's going to work or we've launched this new permit wizard. That's like the new thing. Everybody's coming out with a permit wizard. And what we find is our clients are saying, man, this is terrible. It was so much easier before when it was when it was paper or when it was you know the hybrid system. I can't figure this out. I'm locked out of mm -hmm. my account. I, I'm, I I submitted. It's just sitting there. I can't get in touch with anybody. So we actually found the push online made us more efficient, but also made us that much more valuable. Because now in a lot of jurisdictions, even to this day, they're still in this remote work hybrid thing, and you can't go to somebody's office. They're at home. They they can't physically. They can't see you, and they won't see you. And so yep. you have to know how to navigate that, that process. Brilliant. What's um, the rest of 2022 got in store for you guys? 2022. Um, so we're looking to close out uh, Q4 as strong as we can. Uh, I would say the majority of our book is residential. And so we've, we've mm -hmm. seen with the climate here in, in, in the U.S., inflation and the economy, a lot of yep. projects have canceled. They've... Um, They've been postponed, or they've been uh, they've done cost mitigation. Maybe they were going to do an addition, a pool, and a deck. Now they're just going to do the deck, and they're going to hold off on the pool and the addition. 
And so we've had certifications for a long time. We're, we're minority business certified with NMSDC. Uh, we have our veteran certification with the uh, NAVOBA, the National Veterans Organization. We recently got HUBZone certified with the federal government. We should have our SB8A certification very soon, as well as DBE. Um, and the point is we're getting as many certs as we can. I, I think by the end of 2022, I'll have every cert I can, except for a, uh, a women-owned certification. I, I, I don't qualify for. <laughs> um, but uh, That's wise. That's wise. wise. <laughs> I could identify, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, all jokes aside, I, I, I look to get all those certifications and we're yeah. looking to really attack that commercial and institutional sector of business. Um, we're not going to be awarded a prime contract, not because I don't mm -hmm. think we're capable or competent, but that's not the way they work at the local, state and federal level. They'll usually get awarded to A&E or general contracting firms. But if we mm -hmm. can position ourselves as being a fully certified entity if there are set asides or requirements that they need to meet in addition to us being one of the best in the business and very professional and, and leveraging technology i think we'll, we'll be able to prove very valuable on these larger scale projects and so we've been working very hard on um, finishing out those certifications and business development with uh, those larger entities and those larger uh, suppliers and purchasers of construction and architectural services so that we're on that list of people that are called. Because that's one of the biggest challenges. Oftentimes, when an award goes out, by the time the job is awarded, the A&E or GC has already declared all of their subcontractors, including their expediter. And so right. we, are, we are looking to disrupt that process in a positive way. Uh, and one of the ways that we're doing it is we are finding the work and approaching the A&E and GC firms and asking them if they knew about it, would they like to apply, do they need help reaching out, providing that information so we're not coming empty handed. And then on the mm -hmm. back end, by the way, we're a full service expediting firm. If you need help with this project, should you be awarded or any of your current and ongoing projects, please let us know. You know, we're nationwide and we can, we'd love to help you out. Amazing. Jesse, I didn't think I would enjoy spending an hour talking about expediting as much as I have done. So I really, really appreciate your time this afternoon. It's a perfect place to, for us to conclude the conversation. Really fascinating what you're doing. And I really love the entrepreneurial innovation that you've brought to what some might have considered in the past an unsexy part of the building industry sure. and you've certainly brought a level of glamour and excitement to it which is you know really really exciting to see so thank you very much thank you ryan thank you for having me and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.